Lots of people have been asking me about the jump in event recently, so I'm going to break it down, talk about how the event works, and if, is it good for building a collection for Eldraine or for building standard in general? We're going to find out how that works and if it's better than buying packs or drafting. So let's get into it. Welcome back to the channel. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. You don't miss out on any future videos like this. Today, we're going to talk about the jump in event and it's changed recently or it kind of changed back to what it used to be because jump in always used to be a format where you could choose uh, small packs from different standard legal sets and there would be about 10 sets, 10 packs, 10 packs for each set that's come out. So there was like uh, 10 that covered Innistrad and then there were 10 that covered Kamigawa and there were 10 for each one. And when you play jump in, you would pick two different packs and you would put them together to make a kind of draft level power, power level deck and um, yeah, play against other people using the same kind of decks. Now in the, the um, packs that you pick, you would get about 11 cards. And one of those would be a rare and the others would be commons or uncommons. And you'd put them together. So you basically get two rares or mythics and a bunch of other commons, uncommons, 20 of those. And then you get some lands and some two color lands thrown in as well. So that's what it used to be. It used to be like 10 packs from each set. And then when Lord of the Rings came out, it became jump in specifically for Lord of the Rings. And the only thing you could get in there were the Lord of the Rings packs. But now, since Worlds of Eldraine has come out, it's back to regular jump in, which includes Lord of the Rings packs, but it also includes all those other standard legal packs that used to be in there, but then got taken out for Lord of the Rings. So now they're all back. So. Um, I'm going to show you how the event works. If you haven't seen already, um, it's going to be really quick. We're just going to pay our thousand gold. You could pay in gems, but I wouldn't. I'd just pay in gold if you have gold. And sometimes you have draft tokens, not draft tokens. Sometimes you have jump in tokens. They're little red tokens that appear in the same place where draft tokens appear. If you have any of those on your account, you might as well use them here because they are not usable in any other way. They can only be used to do jump in events and it saves you a thousand gold. So what we need to do is we're going to enter the event and we get to choose um, from three different themed packs. So we have here the muscle pack, which you can see is from Dominaria, breakfast, which is from Lord of the Rings and rooted, which is from March of the machine. So we can pick um, any one of those and the one we pick will kind of influence the second one we get to choose because we're choosing two different packs. So I'm going to pick the muscle one and confirm that. And then we get to choose our second themed pack. We've got invaders from March of the Machine, Resistance, which is also from March, and Oily, which is from Phyrexia All We One. So I'm going to choose Resistance. And now we have our two different packs. And when you play your games, if you win, then you get to win one uncommon card reward or at least uncommon it can be upgraded to rare at the same of normal rates that it can be upgraded but most of the time it's going to be an uncommon card so basically out of spending a thousand gold we've got two rares 20 other commons and uncommons and then one additional probably uncommon from completing the event so one thing you might be wondering is because this is a thousand gold, is it better to spend a thousand gold on jump in or spend a thousand gold on a pack? And it kind of depends on what your goals are. Because I've done jump in events before and the way that the packs get shown to you depends on how many you've chosen before. Now, unless it's changed, what it always used to be is out of those first three packs it shows you, at least one of those will be one that you haven't chosen before unless you've chosen every single one before, in which case it would just be random. So out of those three, there's probably one I haven't picked. And then out of the second three it shows you, there should be at least one of those you haven't picked as well. So if I've done jump in events since jump in started and I've picked every pack that was available, then in theory, now that Eldraine is out, if I went to jump in and 
uh, spent my thousand gold and entered the event, I should be able to see, at the very least, one uh, Wilds of Eldraine pack. But I didn't see any that time. And I don't know for sure if I would see one if I tried another one. So it's kind of a gamble as to whether you're going to actually get the uh, you know the packs from the set that you want. So if I specifically wanted to build my Eldraine collection, it would be much better for me to buy an Eldraine pack than to enter the jump in event because the jump in event might get me zero cards from Eldraine and then it's kind of useless. But if you want to build a collection of standard in general, if there are lots of maybe old sets uh, in standard that you don't have many uh, cards in, like if you want to get like Stoke the Flames was a good card there, Voldaren Thrill Seeker is quite fun, Guardian of New Benalia is um, quite useful. There's um, a good few cards in there that will be quite playable in the standard and if you don't have them already you might want to try and pick them up. But like I said if you're specifically trying to build your collection for Eldraine then doing the jump in event could potentially be a complete waste of your time. But like I said, if you have the jump in tokens, you might as well use them because they're just sitting there. They don't, they're don't. not useful for anything else. You can just enter the event and you can play the game and you can try and win the uncommon card reward. Or if you really want to just pick the packs and move on, you can just resign and you can pay again. You can enter and pick two other packs. So you can basically just go around again and pick lots. Now as to whether you're likely to see the Eldraine packs or not. Um, it's really hard to say. Like I said, it depends on whether you've chosen them before, whether you've played Jump In before and chosen many of the other packs, because if you haven't, there's a good chance you're going to see older packs instead. On my free-to-play account, my second account, I um, entered 20 Jump In events just for you guys, just for research. And out of my 20,000 gold that I spent on Jump In events, I found like 11 or 12 of the new packs. And a couple of them were duplicates. I think there's one out of the 10 new packs that have been added that I haven't got at all. So I've got kind of like the other nine and a couple of duplicates. So although for your 1,000 gold, you're getting two rares and 20 other commons and uncommons, of my 20,000 gold that I put in, I only really got half the uh, value that I should have got specifically for the Eldraine set. But when you compare it to packs in general, doing a jump in events getting you two rares and 20 commons and uncommons. Buying a pack is going to get you, when you include the golden pack progress and the wildcard track as well, buying a pack will get you about 1.8 rares and seven commons. So you're going to get almost the same number of rares overall, um, but you're going to get a lot less in commons and uncommons, which means if you were doing extra events of these, then the jump in events are going to be worth a lot more in vault progress to you because you're going to get all the extra commons and uncommons. If you already have four copies of them, all the um, extras go to your vault. Mine's currently at 41.5%. When it gets to 100, I get pretty much three decent wild cards and three other uncommon ones. And a lot of people have asked me whether you should do like jump in or packs or draft, quick draft, especially when you're not good at drafting and you're just doing it to build a collection because we're trying to build the best Eldraine collection we can at the moment. So I've multiplied it up. Instead of just doing one event, I've uh, worked out the figures. If you were playing 10 events or spending 10,000 gold on jump ins or packs or quick drafts. So this is how it works out. Um, with jump in, it's pretty simple. You just multiply it up. Doing 10 jump in events will get you, in theory, 20 rares or mythics and 200 commons or uncommons. And at the worst, if you already have all of those commons and uncommons, maybe from older sets, then you're going to get about 30 to 40% of your vault progress completed just by doing these 10 jump in events which is a huge boost to your vault progress but because the vault only really gives you three decent wild cards getting 30 to 40 percent of the vault completed is effectively the same as getting one extra rare if you really want to kind of try and work out the value as closely as possible so instead of um looking at the commons and uncommons because most of them aren't really going to be that playable in standard constructed 
a lot of them really aren't that good because there's so many cards in the set. So doing 10 jumping events will pretty much get you like 21 rares, I think is the best way of looking at it. And if you're buying 10 packs for your 10,000 gold, you're going to get 18 rares. It's going to be, well, 17.8 or something like that, but I'm rounding up to 18 uh, when you include the golden pack progress and the wild card track as well. And then you'll get about 70 commons uncommons, which will work out to be around 10, 11% of the vault progress. So a very small amount of vault progress in comparison to the jump-ins. But you're going to get 18 rares compared to 21 for jump-ins. So it's it's almost the same. It is slightly worse overall because you are getting fewer rares, but they're going to be specifically from the Eldraine set. So if you really want to build Eldraine packs, 18 rares from Eldraine is better than 21 rares from other standard sets. And then the third option is doing quick drafts. So um, the value you get from quick drafts completely depends on how many wins you get. So I can't tell you exactly what you're going to get, but I can tell you the absolute minimum and then the average of what I think you can get. And then the maximum is going infinite if you just get seven wins over and over again. So I can't tell you like a maximum amount because it could just be um, completing the whole set if you're really that good at draft. But if you're that good at draft, do premier draft, not quick draft. Um, so if we're doing two quick drafts, because that's 5,000 gold each, so 10,000 gold being spent on events would be two quick drafts. And at the very least, from doing two quick drafts, you would get eight rares because you get three that you'll see from opening packs in the draft event, and you get one pack as a reward even if you get no wins. So that's four for each event. And we're doing two events, so that's going to be eight rares. And you're going to get about 80 or 85 commons and uncommons as well as that, which is very similar to the buying packs. You'll have about 11% vault progress or somewhere around there. If you pick more uncommons, the vault progress is going to be higher, but there's not very many uncommons in the packs, so you probably won't get too many of those. But you will also get 100 gems because you get 50 gems for each event, even if you don't win anything. So that's the absolute minimum, would be eight rares, um, the commons match packs. So it basically means with packs, you're getting about 10 more rares than quick drafts. Um, and you get 100 gems as well on the quick draft, which is a little bit extra. But buying packs here is definitely better than doing quick drafts. But that's if you don't see any other rares in the quick draft. If you just pick the ones that you open, from the three packs. If you get past extra rares, then quick draft is going to be worth more than that. But whether it's going to be more than packs is kind of hard to say. Now, if you did get three wins in your quick draft events, so you're kind of getting a 50% win rate, then instead of getting just eight rares, you would get those eight rares to start with, you'd get the commons, but you'd also get 600 gems from completing the two events. And when you get 600 gems, that's almost enough to pay for another quick draft. So if you're getting three wins in your quick draft, it's kind of like doing three events rather than two because they kind of, they're going to pay for themselves. So that means that you're going to get at least 12 rares by um, picking the ones from the packs and getting the reward packs that you open later on as well. But it's probably going to be more than that because you will get past some extra rares. Now, how many you get, I can't say. It could be you get twice as many. Maybe you don't get quite that much. But for 10 packs, you're getting 18 rares. For two quick drafts at 50% win rate, you're getting at least 12. And maybe you'll get 18. Maybe you'll get more than 18. It's really hard to say. But at least with quick drafts, you know that you're picking cards from Eldraine if you want to just build it from that set. But it's still a bit of a gamble because you don't know what you're going to pick. So packs are definitely the most guaranteed way to build um, a set from, build your collection from a particular set. So if you want to build from Wild of Eldraine, buying packs is going to be better than doing jump in. But jump in is better if you're trying to build a collection overall. So it completely depends on your goals, what you want to build, and what your collection is already. So the last thing we're going to do um, for today is we're going to have a look at the actual jump in packs so you'll know what to look for and pretty much how to use them if you do come across them. But remember, when you do pick them, you're going to be picking two different packs 
So how they work together, I can't tell you because you could pick any two, any combination of two packs. But I can tell you how each of those packs work within themselves and then how they work together. You'll have to figure out as you go. So we're kicking it off with the first jump in pack, which is Charmed. It's a white pack that basically works on enchantments. And um, so these are the most important cards in the pack. We've got a Spellbook Vendor, which can create a Sorcerer at Roll token every turn and attach to one of your creatures. You just have to pay one mana. And when that comes in, it's going to give your creature plus one, plus one, and allow it to scry when it attacks. So that's going to be really useful to create that value every turn. Uh, we've got lots of other enchantment synergies here. So we've got Slumbering Keep Guard. Uh, whenever an en uh, enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, you get to scry again. And um, it gets plus one, plus one until end of turn for each enchantment you control. So when those sorcerer tokens come in, you get to scry on them entering and you get to scry when the creature attacks with them. Uh, Return triumphant, triumphant will bring a creature back from the graveyard and attach a young hero aura roll to it, which will give it plus one, plus one when it attacks, as long as its toughness is lower than three. Uh, when it gets to that point, it doesn't do anything else. We've got Kellen Lightblade, which can do three damage to attacking or blocking creature, and you can bargain it, which means you sacrifice an artifact, enchantment, or token to be able to just destroy a creature rather than just doing three damage. We've got Hopeful Vigil, which can create a 2 2 White Knight with Vigilance, but also can sacrifice itself and scry two. Cooped Up, which is a pacify style enchantment. Uh, but can also exile the creature that it's attached to. Um, and there's lots of reasons why these have the extra kind of sacrifice and exile things. Because we have Knight of Doves, which is like the main card, from the, it's the one on the picture anyway, um, which says that whenever an enchantment you control is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, you create a 1-1 uh, bird token. So these things get put into the graveyard by bargaining them, which gets rid of them. If you attach a sorcerer role to a creature that already has a role then the existing role will be pushed off into the graveyard and the new one will be attached to the creature so that goes to the graveyard if you have cooped up and you exile the enchanted creature and cooped up goes to the graveyard hopeful vigil can sacrifice itself all of these things will help knight of doves produce lots of flying bird creatures We've also got uh, Princess Takes Flight, which is really good at exiling creatures, but it does bring them back on the third turn. So if you can exile one of your opponent's biggest creatures on turn one, or not turn one, on the first turn that this one comes out, then on the second turn you get a buff. And during that turn, if you can maybe bargain away Princess Takes Flight or destroy it, then uh, they don't get that creature back on the third turn. But you also get a 1-1 bird if you have Knight of Doves out. So it's a good removal, um, but it does give the creature back if you can't get rid of it. And then we've got Cursed Courtier, which is a really good creature, but it comes out as a 3-mana 1-1 one, one with lifelink because it has a Cursed roll on it. But if you can use Spellbook Vendor um, to put a Sorcerer token onto Cursed Courtier instead, the Curse will disappear, and it won't be a 1-1 one, one lifelink. It will be a 4-4 four, four lifelink that scries when it attacks, which is much better. And then we've got Rhyme for Reindeer as well. This is a really, really good creature, especially when you have enchantments entering all the time because you can tap a creature that your opponent controls every time and it's going to help you get your damage through, basically, if the uh, if the, all the birds aren't going to help you anyway. And then we've got Dutiful Griffin, a 5-mana 4-4 four, four flyer where you can sacrifice two enchantments and return it from the graveyard to your hand again. It's a shame it's not to the battlefield. But it's only an uncommon, so what do you expect? Um, but if you have Princess Takes Flight, you can do that on a turn, exile one of your opponent's things, and then you can sacrifice that uh, enchantment, that saga, with the griffin. So those are some different kind of synergies that are going on in deck. Uh, there's some other things you might get instead of these cards, because there's four of the cards in the packs that can be... Um, different cards that have a chance of being different ones. So the first one is Spellbook Vendor. Instead of this rare that we're getting here, we could get this mythic instead, Virtue of Loyalty, to create a knight. And then it's a five mana enchantment, which puts plus one counters on all your creatures um, at the end of your turn and untaps those creatures as well. So if you have lots of 1-1 one -one birds, they're going to get bigger 
they're going to untap and be good for blockers as well. Or we've got Rhyme for Reindeer, could be Besotted Knight, which has a sorcery to create a royal roll token, which is plus one, plus one, and ward one on one of your creatures, which is, like I said, good to put on the uh, on the Cursed Courtier because it gets rid of that Cursed token. And it also can just be a 3-3 three, three that comes out, which is four mana, which isn't that good. Rhyme for Reindeer is definitely much better than Besotted Knight. Then we've got Break the Spell. This could come out instead of uh, Return Triumphant. That kind of reanimates one of your creatures. Break the Spell is really good because you can destroy an enchantment. And if it's one you control um, or a token, then you draw a card. So you could destroy your own Princess Takes Flight when you exile the opponent's creatures. Or you can uh, destroy a, um, a roll on one of your opponents or if they have a um, an enchantment that's also a token that isn't a roll you could destroy that and you get to draw a card all for one mana uh, instant speed which is really good and then Kellen light blades the three damage to an attacking creature could be archon's glory a one mana instant that can bargain and give a creature plus two plus two to the end of turn and if it's bargained they also gain flying and lifelink which is really really good especially if it's like i don't know um, with Vigilance as well, because you get to do that damage. And you also get to have that as a blocker. And Bargain, again, means you can get rid of one of these enchantments if you want to get rid of them. Like Especially having something like uh, Hopeful Vigil. When it goes into the graveyard, you get to Scry. You could pay three mana to sacrifice it, but it's much better to get additional value from something else by bargaining and sacrificing it then. You still get the Scry too, and you get Flying and Lifelink from Archon's Glory as well. So that's the Charmed deck that you could get in the jumping events. Next deck is the blue deck, which is the Apprentice deck. Now this one is a bit more controlly and works by drawing lots of cards and then getting big creatures out with a couple of little tricks as well. So first of all, the rare in the pack, we have Ingenious Prodigy, which is a an X and one, uh, one blue mana. Um, zero, one creature with Skulk, so it means it can't be blocked by creatures with greater power than it has, uh, but it doesn't come out as a zero because it can enter, well, it can enter as a zero, zero one. But if you pay some extra with the X, it enters with that many plus one, plus one counters on it. So it scales up depending on how much mana you have. So it can be really big. And at the beginning of your upkeep, if it has one or more plus one counters on it, you may remove one. And if you do draw a card, so you pay lots up front, and then it slowly draws you extra cards each turn while it gets smaller, which is kind of an interesting card. I'm not sure how good it is, but that's uh, that's what the kind of deck's based around. And then we've got some other things here that are just a bit more controlly. So Aquatic Alchemist can use uh, Bubble Up, a sorcery, to put an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard back on top of your library if you've already used it. And when you cast your first instant or sorcery, it gets plus two uh, power till end of turn. We've got Gadwick's first duel. I really like this one. It's a two mana enchantment. It creates a cursed roll token on one of your uh, opponent's creatures. In fact, it doesn't have to be an opponent's creature, but I'm pretty sure you want to put it on your opponent, not on yourself. Although if you put it on in Ingenious Prodigy, it's going to be a 1-1 one, one, rather than a 0-1. But it's more likely your opponent's going to have a big creature you want to turn into a 1-1. One, one. Uh, then you get to Scry 2, and then on the third chapter, you get to copy... Uh, the next instant or sorcery spell you cast with mana value three or less, uh, which is really good. So you two mana to get all this, basically an effective removal, then scry, and then copying a spell. Really good for two mana. Uh, we've got Picklock Prankster that can mill four cards and put an instant sorcery or fairy card from among the milled cards into your hand. Now, there's not really much uh, fairy synergy going on here, so I guess that's just for instants or sorceries in this deck. But it's a good fairy to have for a fairy deck if you're building one. Then it gets um, it's a one three flying vigilance creature um, if you cast it for two as well as a creature. Then we've got water wings till end of turn. It, uh, creature becomes base power and toughness four four gains flying and hexproof, so it's protection or it's extra damage depending on whatever you need. We've got mocking sprite instants and sorceries cost one less to cast which is useful. It is also a fairy, so that works with Picklock Prankster, but it's unlikely you're going to necessarily mill that one, um, especially when you have two different packs, and you're going to have like this pack and another pack, which is probably, unless you pick the fairy pack, and there is one of those, probably not going to have very many other fairies, so 
fairy synergy not working great here. They've got quick study, three mana, draw two cards instant, which is really useful. If you copy that with uh, Gadwick's first jewel, they're drawing four cards, three mana, really, really cool. Uh, we've got Succumb to the Cold, a three mana instant. We can tap um, up to two target creatures and opponent controls, put a stun counter on them. So it's going to delay things a little bit and save you a bit of time. Um, Chancellor of Tales. Oh, yeah, it's another fairy. Okay, there's like three fairies in the deck, so maybe you never know. Get some fairy um, fairy advantage. Um, okay, we've got a four mana, two, three flyer, which is a bit low on the stats. Whenever you cast an adventure spell, you can copy it and choose new targets. So the adventures we have, the Aquatic Alchemist, we've got the Picklock Prankster can do um, uh, an adventure. And then we've got uh, the Vantress Transmuter is an adventure as well, and the uh, Balloonas Gatekeeper, the bigger creature. So the Transmuter can tap a target creature and put a Cursed Roll token on it. So if we can copy that, um, then we can get two Cursed tokens on things. So it's really slowing down the opponent and not removing their creatures, but turning them into 1-1s, one -ones, which are easy to block. Um, oh, well, we've got Balloonas Gatekeeper. That's the big card from this deck. 6-5 Giant for 6 mana. But you can also cast a sorcery that returns a creature you don't control mana value three or less to its owner's hand. So kind of like a fading hope, sending it back to the hand. So um, and obviously you can copy that if you have Chancellor of Tales out. It's a really good creature to have out, which I think probably does a lot more for the deck than Ingenious Prodigy. I don't really know if it's that good. Um, so that's generally how the deck works. You want to draw lots of cards and remove the opponent's things and maybe start getting some big creatures out or just chipping away at them with these flying creatures. Although they don't do a huge amount of damage, but two or three or four or five each turn is going to add up really quickly if you get a few of those fairies out. And it obviously depends on what the other half of the pack, the deck you end up playing is. So there's some uh, cards here that could be swapped out for other things. So we've got the Ingenious Prodigy could be swapped out for the Horned Lock Whale, which I think is a much better card. Um, so you can put a creature that's attacking uh, the opponent has back on the top or bottom of their library. So send that back to the hand. And it's a six mana flash ward to six six creature. It enters taps, but um, you so you don't put it out as an ambush to stop uh, attackers that are coming at you to block them. But you can put it at the end of your opponent's turn and then at the beginning of your turn it's kind of like having haste because it gets to attack straight away. But also you have all that mana still available because you've just untapped everything. So definitely a good rare that can work in other controly decks as well. Then we've got Picklock Prankster. Could be swapped out for Tenacious Tome Seeker. A 3 mana, 3-2 three, human knight that when it enters a battlefield, you can return instant or sorcery from your graveyard to your hand. So maybe if you've got like quick study in the graveyard, then you want to cast that again. You can bargain which means you have to get rid of a um, an enchantment that you control. You could maybe sacrifice first jewel if you really had to bargain something, or you could have some cursed roll tokens on an opponent's creature. Maybe you put it on a 2-2, and you'd much rather just sacrifice the cursed roll rather than leave that 2-2 as a 1-1 if you're not losing too much by sacrificing that roll. Especially if maybe you have another one you can put on it afterwards. Uh, then we've got Splashy Spellcaster. This can be swapped out for uh, the Chancellor of Tales. So instead of having copying adventure spells, we could instead, whenever we cast an instant sorcery uh, spell, we create a sorcerer roll token attached to a creature we control, which is going to work better with um, going to work better with anything with bargain because we're going to have more roll tokens on us. It doesn't work quite so well and loses that adventure synergy. Um, and then we've got Johan's Stopgap, a four mana sorcery with bargain. They can return non land permanent to its owner's hand, and you draw a card, so gaining some advantage. And um, it can cost two less to cast if it's bargained rather than being four, it's only going to be two mana. So that's the apprentice deck, uh, much more slow, controlly, drawing lots of cards, and maybe getting in. Uh, some damage at the end with uh, the gatekeeper or the whale if you have that um, just to finish off the game the next pack you could pick is the black pack which is called bittersweet 
which works on creating um, food tokens and pretty much removing things. There's a couple of good creatures in there as well. So depending on which pack you match this up with, uh, this one's kind of like, yeah, the more removal side of things because we have Candy Grapple that can give something minus three, minus three, or Bargain to give it minus five, minus five. We've got Minstrosity, which is a really good creature. I quite like this one, like for a common uh, at the very least. Two mana, three, one. When it dies, you create a food token. You can sacrifice food tokens um, and pay two mana to gain three life. So having those, they're kind of aggressive creatures, but once they die, they give you additional value. You've got the Witch's Vanity. This is another really good saga. When you um, play it, you can destroy a creature your opponent has of mana value two or less. Then you can create a food token. Then on the third turn, you can create a wicked token. So it gives you some good value for bargaining because you get the food token and the wicked token. If you want to bargain them later on, you can. And the wicked token is quite a good one to bargain because when you bargain it, it goes to the graveyard. Um, when it goes to the graveyard, your opponent loses one life as well. So you get additional value from bargaining on top of the normal bargain value. Then we've got back for seconds, returning two creatures from our graveyard to our hand or bargaining it puts one of them out on the battlefield as well. We've got Conceited Witch, which is a 2-3 with Menace for three mana, but also is a sorcery or has a sorcery that can create, can create a wicked roll token on one of your creatures. So lots of these wicked roll tokens with Gumdrop Gum drop poisoner, we can create a food token with a, an instant, or we can put them out as a 3 2 lifelink. When it enters, up to one creature gets minus x minus x till end of turn, where x is the amount of life we gain this turn. So we could be sacrificing our food tokens and then playing out gum drop poisoner. If we've only gained life from those food tokens, we would have had to spend some mana on doing that. But then at least you can give something of the opponent's minus three, minus three, which is going to help um, turn the tides on the battlefield. Uh, then we've got Sweet Tooth Witch, three mana, three, two. When it enters, you create a food token, which is nice. And you can pay two to sacrifice a food and make the opponent lose two life rather than you gaining three life from sacrificing it. So if you just need to finish them off, uh, having a few food tokens might be um, what you need to be able to do that. Then we've got Stingblade Assassin, a 3-1 Flash Flyer. When it enters, you can destroy a creature the opponent controls that was dealt damage this turn. So if you've done some damage with, I don't know, maybe you would have done some damage with one of these creatures, like Conceited Witch, um, could have been blocked by things, done some damage to a couple of creatures, and then you could play Stingblade Assassin to finish one of them off. Um, then we've got Taken by Nightmares, a 4-mana instant, just to exile a creature, and if you control an enchantment, Scry 2, there's a good chance we um, control enchantments in this deck because we have um, those wicked roll tokens. We have the Witch's Vanity itself. Um, they are all their enchantments. So um, we get an extra Scry 2. If you mix this with maybe the white deck that has loads of enchantments, then obviously that's going to um, boost that the likelihood that you're getting the most value from Taken by Nightmares. And then we've got High Fey Negotiator, a 5-mana 3-5 flyer. Um, if you bargain, then when it enters, the opponent loses 3 life and you gain 3 life. So there's a good amount of um, life gaining here and draining the opponent to help you last a bit longer. Um, and like I said, depending on what you're matching that with, that can be a really powerful strategy. Um, now we've got the sideboard cards or the other cards they could be. Um, so Gumdrop Poisoner could be a virtue of persistence. So that's a two mana sorcery that gives something minus three, minus three, and you gain two life. Or later on, it could be a seven mana enchantment, which is a bit like a portal to Phyrexia. At the beginning of your upkeep, you return a creature from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. That's your graveyard or their graveyard. So it's a really, really powerful thing to have um, just like a portal to Phyrexia apart from the portal to Phyrexia costs nine instead of seven and makes the opponent sacrifice three things three creatures so uh, yeah portal's better but this is cheaper so it kind of balances out and you get the added value of having that uh, sorcery gives something minus three minus three as well
instead of conceited witch we might get voracious vermin this is going to work much better in a deck with lots of little creatures we have some here but not a huge amount but it enters with uh, as a 2-1 and it creates a 1-1 uh, black rat as well when it enters and whenever a creature you control dies you can put a plus one plus one counter on voracious vermin so you want to basically be able to produce lots of creatures that die very easily to make this one really big so you've got a few things you might trade off like minstrosity you want to get rid of we can also use bargain on the rat tokens uh, which then kills the rat tokens and uh, that triggers voracious vermin because whenever another creature you control dies doesn't have to be specifically token or non-token. So that's going to keep adding value onto Voracious Vermin, and that can grow pretty quickly and grow out of control. Then instead of the Stingblade Assassin, which is kind of semi-removal, we also have Screen Puff. That could come in instead. It's a 4-5 Death Touch, which sounds very familiar. It's a bit like Shield Red, but it's more expensive and it does less. But then it's a common. Uh, when it enters, um, you... Um, oh no, when it deals combat damage to a player, you get to create a food token. So the good thing about this is you're attacking. They don't want to block a 4-5 death touch because the chances are they're going to lose their creature and you're not. So it's a choice between them lo losing a creature and letting you create another food token. And it's a very hard choice, to be honest. So it's a really good card to finish things off as long as the opponent can't just block it with 2 or 3, do 5 damage to it. And then instead of the candy grapple, we've got Rowan's Grim Search, which is basically looking at the top four of your library and putting two into the graveyard and two of them you're going to draw and you lose two life as well. If, if you do the bargain, you get to then kind of shuffle those cards around and put two into your uh, graveyard. If you don't bargain this, then it's three mana just to draw two cards and lose two life. So it's much better if you uh, get to bargain it because you get to basically kind of um, just throw away, filter through the extra things you don't need and just pick the ones you do out of your top four. So that's the bittersweet deck. Um, there are certain elements that work well with rats. There are certain elements that might work well with um, like fairies or the other blue deck. And there are certain elements that might work with a Golga Golgari food combo of making lots of um, food tokens and being able to sacrifice them to do damage and things like that so that is the black deck let me know what you think of this one in the comments the last mono colored uh, pack is the hungry pack which is the green pack and this one works on um, food synergies so it works really well with the black one for example um, so we have uh, bramble familiar which is a ramp creature two mana two two that can tap for green or can return to its owner's hand if needed because you also have a, um, a sorcery which is seven mana the adventure part of the card the mill seven cards and put the creature enchantment or land card from among them onto the battlefield so if you have some really big creatures this can help you find them and get them out and we have a couple of relatively big things in this deck we've got titanic growth which is a standard plus four plus four combat trick which is um, pretty useful, especially when you have Tramble, which we do have in other creatures. We have Tough Cookie, which is a food creature. When it enters, it creates another food token, so that's two foods. Um, you can pay three mana to turn a non-creature artifact into a 4-4 four, four creature, which works on food tokens because they are artifacts. And you can pay two and sacrifice Tough Cookie to gain three life, which is normal for food. So basically, this is just the way food normally reacts. So it's a um, really useful creature for getting lots of food out and making good use of that food. And speaking of making good use of food, we've got Welcome to Sweet Tooth, a saga that creates a 1-1 human, which is good for bargain if you have any bargain cards. Although this one, I don't believe, has any bargain cards in it. But it helps to enable bargain if we have another pack that goes with this that uses bargain. Then it creates a food token on the second chapter. And on the third chapter... You can put X 1-1 one, one counters on target creature you control, where X is 1 plus the number of foods you control. Now there are quite a few ways of producing foods in this um, in this deck, in this pack. So this can be really, really big, especially uh, when you have Trample as well. So we've also got Curse of the Werefox, 
j3 mana sorcery to create a monster roll token and um, then on that creature that receives the token you fight it uh, with another creature so it's removal but it's also giving trample to something else and um, we've got hollow scavenger that can create a food with its adventure sorcery and can also eat the food um, when it's a 3-2 creature it can pay one to pretty much eat a food and get plus two plus two till end of turn we've got return from the wild a sorcery that can find a land and put it onto the battlefield or create another 1-1 one, one human token, which is good for bargain. Or we can uh, create a food token there. We've got Knight of the Sweets Revenge, which is an enchantment that's really useful, especially for kind of ramp decks and food decks, because when it enters, you create a food. Now, foods also can tap for green, which also includes Tough Cookie because it does have the food type, subtype. And then we've got... Um, seven mana, you can sacrifice Knight of the Sweets Revenge. Creatures get plus X plus X, where X is the number of foods you control. Um, I think there's about seven different ways of making food in this, just in these 11 cards. So that's going to be really powerful. Uh, we've also got Sky Beast Tracker, four mana, two, four creature with reach. Um, whenever you cast a spell with mana value five or greater, create a food token. And we've got a couple of spells that are five or greater here. Agatha's Champion, oh, there's the bargain we're looking for. Um, it's a 4-4 four, four, um, creature with Trample and Bargain, and if you bargain when it enters, it gets to fight another creature. So we've got some 1-1s. One, if we don't want to sacrifice a food token, because we want to keep those foods around, we can. We do have ways of making a 1-1 one, one human that we can sacrifice to Agatha's Champion to help turn that into removal as well. And then we have Hamlet Glutton, a 7-mana six, 6-6 six, six, Trample, uh, which gains 3 life when it enters, but if we bargain it it can um, cost two less to cast. So yeah, a couple of different ways of bargaining. Um, it kind of seems more thematic that this one bargains a food token because you're gaining three life when it enters and it costs two less. And two is how much it would cost to sacrifice a food token to gain three life. So it kind of seems more thematic if it's a food token, but you could just sacrifice a 1-1 one, one human to this. Um, and getting out a five mana, essentially, 6-6, six, six, trample, um, that gains you three life and creates another food token if we have Sky Beast Tracker out. Um, if we then have Welcome to Sweet Tooth or Knight of the Sweets Revenge and give something lots of plus one counters or plus X plus X, which is quite a lot, then these big trample creatures are going to pretty easily finish off the game. So uh, in the sideboard for this one, uh, we could have Brave the Wilds instead of Return from the Wilds, um, which can bargain again is the other way of finding a land in the um, in the deck, puts it into your hand rather than the battlefield. But if you bargain, you can turn a land into a 3-3 elemental creature, um, which is not until end of turn. That stays as a 3-3 creature forever. You've got Leaping Ambush, which instead of Titanic Growth, which was the plus four, plus four, this is plus one, plus three, and reach and untap, which um, maybe isn't quite as good because it's more of a defensive spell, I guess, defensive ambush kind of spell, um, because it's called Leaping Ambush, that makes sense. Uh, but Titanic Growth is probably slightly better. And we've got Elvish Archivist, which is a really good rare to get in this deck, because uh, whenever one or more artifacts enter once per turn, you get two plus one plus one counters on uh, the Archivist. So every time a food token comes in, you're getting plus two plus two onto it so even though it looks bad coming in as a zero one it actually grows pretty quickly and also whenever an enchantment enter enters the battlefield you get to draw a card so we've got a couple of different ways of creating enchantments uh, we've got welcome to sweet tooth is an enchantment we've got curse of the werefox puts a monster roll which is an aura which is an enchantment and knight of the sweets revenge is an enchantment as well so we have a few ways of drawing extra cards with this, but maybe creating those food artifacts is the better side of this. And then we've also got Beanstalk Worm, which is an alternative big creature, uh, which can help you ramp out by playing an extra land um, if you use the adventure side, or is just a 5-4 creature with reach. So reach, obviously, a bit more defensive, whereas trample is much more aggressive. So um, depending on which one of those big creatures you get in your version of the deck um, might determine if your deck is slightly more aggressive. So either one is uh, still really good. 
it probably works really well, especially if you have the Archivist with the white version, the um, Charmed pack, because then you're going to create lots of different um, enchantments and you're going to be drawing loads of extra cards with uh, the Elf there. So that's the last mono-coloured one. We then got the five um, two-colour decks. So I'm going to go on to those really quickly. First of all, we have the freezing pack, which is the blue and white that works on tapping creatures in general um, and little uh, tricks like that. So we'll just start from the bottom. We've got Snare, Master, Sprite, a one mana, um, one one flying fairy. When it enters, you can pay two to tap a creature and opponent controls put a stun counter on it. So it stops them from doing very much. We've got Frostbridge Guard, a two mana, two two that can tap a target creature. We have Plunge into Winter, a two mana instant that can tap a target creature again. Uh, scry one and draw a card. So lots of kind of slowing down the opponent and um, removing things. So at the moment, like Bitter Chill is a two mana aura that can tap a creature um, and it doesn't untap. And then if Bitter Chill is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, so if the opponent manages to maybe sacrifice their creature, you can pay one. And um, if you do, you get to scry one and draw a card as well, which is a really good uh, value if the opponent loses that creature for whatever reason. Uh, we've got Living Lectern, a two mana zero four um, artifact creature, um, and you can sacrifice it and pay one to draw a card and create a sorcerer roll token on something else. So good to block to start with, also adding more value later on. Then we have protective parents, because at some point we do have to attack uh, rather than just remove everything. Um, we've got three mana, three, two creature. When it dies, you create a young hero roll token attached up to one other target creature you control, which might be really good on something like a snare master sprite because it's a one one. So it's going to um, make the most of those plus one counters from the young hero token and it's flying. So has some evasion. We've also got Solitary Sanctuary, a three mana enchantment. When it enters, you can tap a creature and opponent controls, put a stun counter on it to slow them down. And whenever you tap an untapped creature and opponent controls, put a plus one, plus one counter on a creature you control. So this is the payoff for all of the other things that tap the opponent's creatures. Even Bitter Chill, which is um, just to make it stop it from untapping. It also taps the creature when it goes in as well. So we can boost lots of other things with this. We've got Ice Wrought Sentry, a three mana, two, three um, creature with vigilance. When it attacks, you can pay two. And when you do, you tap a creature and opponent controls. And when you do, uh, this also gets plus two, plus one till the end of turn. So it becomes a four, four with vigilance um, that can slow down the opponent, tap some things, stop them from blocking with their best thing. And um, if you have Solitary Sanctuary out, then you're going to add up going to be able to put plus one counters on that as well or something else so that's going to get a lot of value um it's a really good creature for this deck uh we've got hilda's crown of winter it's a three mana artifact you can pay one to tap target creature but it costs one less if it's during your turn so basically you just tap it every turn you can tap an opponent's creature without paying anything but if you want to do it on their turn maybe stop them attacking with a big creature at the beginning of their turn before combat pay the one and tap their creature and then they can't attack with it. And you can pay three to sacrifice this and draw a card for each tapped creature your opponents control. So because we've got um, stun counters and you've got bitter chill and um, for this, the three, you don't have to tap. So you can maybe tap this on your turn. Um, so the opponent's creature taps. You might have bitter chill. You might have something else with um, stun counters on it maybe. Uh, so you might draw two or three cards with this, maybe more, but it's probably not that likely to get more than that. Although if you attack with Ice Rock Sentry, you can tap another thing. So maybe three cards, maybe four if you're really lucky um, for three mana, which is really nice. But you're sacrificing the Crown of Winter, so you can't tap things anymore. But you might need it to get to the end. And then you've got Charay of Numbing Depths, a four mana, two, three legendary Merfolk Wizard. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, you tap a creature, an opponent controls, put a stun counter on it, and whenever you tap one or more untapped creatures from your opponent, you get to draw a card, and you, that only triggers once each turn. But if you use that with Hilda's Crown of Winter, then that's going to give you lots of value, especially if you're tapping an opponent's creature 
on your turn with anything else like Ice Rot Sentry, and then you use Hilda's Crown of Winter on the opponent's turn because this is drawing a card once each turn. You can basically get that to trigger twice for every turn cycle because you're doing it on your turn and the opponent's turn. So um, they work really well together. The Protective Parents doesn't seem that great because the Hero Roll Token isn't going to get that much benefit unless you have like the Snare Master Sprite because this is, has three toughness. This one has three toughness. This one has four toughness. Um, there's pretty much nothing there. This one has three as well. Um, that's going to benefit from the hero roll token out of this uh, selection unless you have the snare master sprite so it's kind of like not not the best card um, at least not for this pack then we've got charmed clothier which is a five mana three three flyer when it enters you create a royal roll token attached to another creature so it can't be this one but it'll give another creature plus one plus one and ward one which might be good on an ice roll sentry or whatever your um if you have a Snare Master Sprite that has the young hero on it, and if it's gained those plus one counters, and it's now a 3-3 flyer, then you could put the Royal Roll token on it and make it a 4-4 flyer with Ward 1 as well. So they work really well together if you get them out in the right order. So that's the Freezing deck. And in the sideboard, the alternative cards you could get, uh, we've got Freeze in place, which is tapping a creature, put three stun counters on it, and Scry 2. So three stun counters is going to put it out of action for three turns. That's really good. Now we've got Stockpiling Celebrant, a three mana, three, two. When it enters, you can return another non-land permanent you control to your hand. And if you do Scry 2, so you might want to return something like uh, if a Bitter Chill is um, tapping down a creature that isn't the biggest thing and then the opponent gets out a much bigger creature, you could bring that back to your hand and then play it out again. Or the Snare Master Sprite, because it has the ETB uh, trigger of being able to target, uh, tap a target creature as well. Um, but other than that, not the best for this uh, deck, but it's okay. Um, we've got Thread Bind Click, which is a 4 mana 3-3 three, three flyer, but also has the um, instant adventure to destroy target tapped creature. So basically, destroy anything, because you're going to have loads of different ways of tapping different creatures. You can pretty much tap anything the opponent has and destroy it. If you have Bitter Chill on a creature and maybe it's the only thing that the opponent has tapped, um, this has the ability of when it goes to the graveyard, you get to pay to scry and draw a card as well. So you might want to use um, the Rip the Seams adventure to destroy that creature which puts Bitter Chill into your graveyard. And then we've got the other... Um, main card from this deck which you might get when you pick this one Hilda of the Icy Crown so instead of actually getting um, Hilda's Crown you get Hilda and that's a 4 mana 3-4 legendary creature when you tap an untapped creature and opponent controls you may pay 1 when you do you can do any one of these things you can make a 4-4 four, four creature which is obviously pretty powerful um, you can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each creature you control now this um, pack doesn't have loads of creatures, but if you match it up with another one that does have lots of creatures, that's going to be even better for you. And you can scry to and draw a card. So whenever you tap an untapped creature. Now you can't have this and the crown in the same pack because you basically get one or the other. But if you happen to pick this twice in the jump in event and you get both of them, then they make a pretty good combination if you're going to make a kind of um, white, blue, um, tapping deck um, that gets lots of value from having those two. So they're pretty good. It's a shame you can't get them together in the jump in. But uh, yeah, it depends what you match this up with. You maybe want to have more creatures uh, because you might just be tapping things the opponent puts out and then run out of steam. But um, other than that, um, if you match it with a good um, partner, then this freezing pack would do pretty well as well. And speaking of packs that would do really well if you match them up with the right thing, we now also have the Fairies one. And Fairies has a lot of support in Worlds of Eldraine. It's potentially a competitive standard deck, and we'll see how that develops. But at the moment, um, it does look pretty good. Um, so we have lots of fairy creatures and lots of other cards that synergize well with fairies. So first of all, we have Fairy Dream Thief, a 1-mana one 1-1 one, one flyer. When it enters, you surveil 1. And when it dies, if it's in the graveyard, you can pay three to exile it, draw a card, and lose one life. 
So that's quite a few extra things for a one mana creature. Uh, we've got Fairy Fencing, which is a really, really effective removal spell as long as you have a fairy because it's an X and black to um, give a target creature minus X minus X until end of turn. And it gets an additional minus three minus three if you control a fairy when you cast it. So that means even if you just have out a Dream Thief, you can pay just one, just the one black for this, and give anything minus three, minus three, which means it can kill anything with three toughness, which is better than cut down, because cut down can only kill something with three toughness if it doesn't have more than two power. So um, that's obviously really, really um, effective, um, especially in a fairy deck. Um, so we also have Spell Stutter, which in a similar way is like Make Disappear, but the opponent has to pay two, like normal, otherwise they, you counter the spell. But they have to pay an additional one for each fairy you control. So even just having one fairy means they have to pay three, which when you're only paying two mana to cast this, um, this counter, if they have to pay three to stop it, then that's really good value. But also, if you can, if you control more fairies, they're going to have to pay even more, and it pretty much becomes a hard counter at this point because they're going to have to pay too much to be able to stop it. Uh, we've got Barrow Naughty, which is a um, two mana one three fairy with flying. It has life link if you control another fairy, and you can pay three to give it plus one plus zero till end of turn, which maybe isn't the best activated ability. But it's something that you can help gain extra life because it has lifelink or normally has lifelink. We've got Obira Dreaming Duelist, two mana, two, two, flash flying fairy. When it enters, or no, when another fairy enters um, under your control, each opponent loses one life. So um, you get this out at the end of your second turn. And then on your third turn, you get one or two fairies out. Your opponent starts losing lots of life. Um, so Mocking Sprite is a three mana fairy which uh, you get in the other deck as well the blue deck instants and sorceries cost one less to cast so if this deck if you pick this deck and the blue one then they're going to work pretty well together because they have other fairies as well uh, we've got talion's messenger a three mana one three flyer when you attack with one or more fairies you draw a card then you discard a card and when you do that you put a plus one counter on a fairy you control so it's helping you filter through your deck and make your creature stronger that's really useful and it's not you don't have to attack with talion's messenger it's whenever you attack with one or more fairies that you can attack with any fairy and put a plus one counter on any other fairy so that's really flexible and useful uh, we've got feed the cauldron which is a three mana instant to destroy target creature with mana value three or less and if it's your turn you create a food token which kind of seems slightly out of place in the fairies deck because um we don't have any other food synergies here that's interesting. It's a, I mean, it's a good card to have. Um, we've got Spell Scorn Coven, a four mana, two, three flyer. When it enters, each opponent discards a card, which obviously is a big pain and slows them down. But you can also pay three for the instant adventure to return a target spell to its owner's hand. So it's like a counter spell, but they get it back into their hand, but just slows them down. We've got Obira's Attendance, a five mana, three, four flyer which is a kind of decent creature, but obviously blue creatures aren't normally that strong. But it's also got the instant adventure where target creature gets minus four, minus zero till end of turn, which obviously is just like a defensive thing. And we've also got into the Fey Court, a five mana sorcery that allows you to draw three cards and create a one, one fairy creature token, um, which can only block creatures with flying, which is a slight downside. But at the very least, you're making more fairies which is going to help with a Byrat. It's going to drain the opponent for one more life. It's going to potentially, uh, well, it's going to make Spell Stutter more powerful. It's going to make sure Fairy Fencing works if you didn't have any other fairies. So there's lots of things you can do with that. Um, in the sideboard or in the other four cards that you could swap out, we've got Pick Lock Prankster. It's a two mana, one three flying Vigilance Fairy, which has the an instant adventure to mill four cards and return an instant sorcery or fairy card from among them into your hand, which is the same as the blue one again. Um, so these two work really well together. And obviously there's lots of instant sorceries and fairy cards in this uh, fairy pack. We've got Misleading Moats, a four mana instant target creature's owner puts it on the top or bottom of their library. 
again, just a tempo move, slowing down your opponent. We've got Dream Spoilers, a 4-mana 2-2 two, two flyer, which sounds really expensive. Uh, but whenever you cast a spell during an opponent's turn, up to one target creature and opponent controls gets minus one, minus one till end of turn. So obviously it completely depends on what your opponent has. But this isn't like once per turn. So if you have a couple of things you want to cast on the opponent's turn, maybe you cast a spell stutter and a fairy fencing to kill something else or a feed the cauldron, you can add those minus ones, minus ones onto the same creature, I guess, and you can kill something that's a two or three toughness. So it sounds kind of expensive, but it's lots of potential removal um, if you happen to have Dream Spoilers out. And then we've got the big one, uh, the Legendary Fairy, Talion the Kindly Lord, 4 mana, 3, 4, Flyer. When it enters the battlefield, you choose a number between 1 and 10, and whenever an opponent casts a spell with mana value, power, or toughness equal to the chosen number, they lose 2 life and you draw a card. So this depends entirely on what kind of deck the opponent has. You have to guess which number is going to be the most effective, depending on maybe what creatures they've cast so far, or if you happen to know, if you're playing this in the jump-in event, if you happen to know what's in the other jump-in packs, um, which is obviously what we're going through now, then you might have a good idea of what number is likely to come up the most. And what's also in interesting about this is whenever they cast a spell, it's not when that resolves. So if they cast a spell and it matches the number that you've chosen, then the um, the triggered ability or the ability triggers um, where they lose two life and you draw a card, and you can still counter that spell with Spell Stutter or if you had any other counter, you can still counter it and you're you know, obviously still getting the, the two life advantage and the card advantage as well. And if Talion ever dies or gets returned to your hand, you can play it out again and you can change the number if it happens to be that um, they're more likely to cast something bigger, maybe. Um, so it's nice to be able to change that again. So that's a really, really good um, deck that might work out really well in Standard as well. If you have a few Talions because you probably want to have that creature out to make everything work really well. And you can pair this really well with the other blue jump in pack if you happen to find that one because of the fairies and instants and sorceries synergies that you'll find in there. Also, the uh, the addition of Feed the Cauldron makes it work um, slightly well with the other black one, which works on um, food as well, but not as much as it worked with other fairies. So that's one creature type that has a lot of kind of tribal synergies in this set. We're going to move on to the other big one, which is Rats. So um, Rats is a black and red more kind of aggro type of deck and it works on having lots of 1-1 one, one rat creatures and boosting those or replacing those if they happen to die. So um, so yeah, to go through the cards, we've got Rat Out, which is a minus one, minus one instant on uh, an opponent's creature. And when you do that, you also create a 1-1 one, one rat creature token. We've got Harried Spear Guard, which is a 1-1 one, one haste creature when it dies, you create a 1-1 one, one Black Rat. We've got Candy Grapple, a 2-mana instant with Bargain that can give a creature minus 3, minus 3, or if it's bargained, it can give it minus 5, minus 5. And these Rat Creature Tokens work really well for bargaining as well because you can sacrifice the Rat Token. We've got Rat Catcher Trainee. It's a 2-mana, a 2-1 creature that has First Strike on your turn. You can also cast the three mana instant adventure to create two more 1-1 one, one black rat creatures. We've got Tattered Ratter, a two mana 2-2. Two, two. Whenever a rat you control becomes blocked, it gets plus two, plus O. Oh. So now we start to see the uh, kind of synergies. The opponent doesn't want to block your 1-1 one, one creature because they're going to take three damage from it. Um, we've got Lord Skitter, the Sewer King, a three mana 3-3 three, three. when it enters. Uh, you can exile a target card from an opponent's graveyard, which, depending on what you're against, could be very, very useful. And at the beginning of combat on your turn, you create another rat. So this is happening every turn. So if you can get Lord Skitter out, keep him alive, then you're going to just have loads and loads of rats as time goes on. We've got Lord Skitter's Butcher, a 3-mana 2-3. Two, three. When it enters, you get to uh, choose one of these. You can create another rat. You can sacrifice another creature, probably a rat. If you do, you scry two and draw a card. 
and creatures you control could gain menace till end of turn. So if you have lots of rats and the opponent doesn't have enough blockers, you can give them all menace so it's harder to block them and they can get lots of damage through. And then you've got uh, Totem Tants, the Swarm Swarm Piper. A uh, three mana, two, three legendary creature. When this creature or another non-token creature you control dies, you create a 1-1 one, one black rat to replace it. And for two mana at instant speed, you can give a target attacking rat you control death touch until end of turn. So you're attacking with lots of little rats. The opponent could block and maybe kill lots of them, but you can decide which one of those is going to have death touch. So they might not want to block because they know they're going to actually lose their creature to the 1-1 one, one rat. And this isn't just once per turn. You have enough mana. You could give two or three different rats um, death touch. So want to block these if you have this creature out. We've got Stingblade Assassin, which is a 4 mana 3-1 flyer uh, fairy with flash, and when it enters you destroy a creature the opponent controls that was dealt damage this turn. So that can work really well with um, having flash, can work really well with Tata to Rata, not that one, <laughs> work really well with Rat Catcher Trainee because it has first strike. So if you attack with this, the opponent blocks with some massive creature. It does the two damage with the first strike and then you can cast um, the Stingblade Assassin uh, because it has flash and you can destroy that big creature before it does damage back to your trainee. But also this works really well when you're attacking with lots of 1-1s and the opponent blocks with a big creature. You can then play this out afterwards. And it's kind of like giving death touch to that rat. You've now destroyed that creature because it took one damage from a rat. Um, and then we've got Twisted Sewer Witch. This is probably my favorite one in the rat deck. When it enters the battlefield, you create a rat. And then for each rat you control, you create a wicked roll token attached to that rat. So we're creating lots of wicked rolls which give all of those rats plus one, plus one. And when the aura is put into the graveyard, the opponent loses one life. So you might have any number of rats, especially if you have Lord Skitter out. You're going to be able to create lots and lots of rats. But rat out, uh, the spear guard, um, we've got the trainee can create rat tokens. Um, yeah, Lord Skitter makes rat tokens. Um, the butcher can make a rat token. And so when Twisted Sewer Witch comes out and makes its rat token itself, you could have quite a lot of rats. And that's going to be a lot of 2-2s attacking now rather than 1-1s and extra life loss if they manage to kill them as well. But you could do things like you could bargain using Candy Grapple and kill one and then the aura goes to the graveyard. Or you can just do that on the aura and the opponent loses one life as well. So it's a really good finisher. If you have lots of rats out and maybe you can't get the blocks through, um, now if they block and kill the creature, they're losing one life anyway. Then the alternative cards we could get here, um, instead of um, Candy Grapple, we could get Torch the Tower. So this is uh, two damage, instant, uh, one red mana um, to target creature or Planeswalker. If it's bargained, you can deal three damage and scry one as well. And anything that's hit by this, it dies, you would exile it instead. We've got Callus Cell Sword, which can um, sacrifice one of your creatures. Uh, basically, you deal damage equal to its power to any other target. Um, there's not that many things that have very high power in this. The Stingblade Assassin is a 3-1, which is okay. Um, you probably don't want to really use this that much on like a bigger thing. Um, and the Twisted Sewer, which is a 3-4, but probably you don't want to um, lose that just to do three damage to something so maybe this is best used on just a rat to be able to do an extra one damage to something for one mana um, but if you need to use it on a bigger thing obviously you have that option as well and other than that it's a two mana two two that enters with a plus one counter on it for each creature that died under your control this turn so if you attack with lots of rats and the opponent blocks and you lose lots of creatures um, then this comes in as a much bigger creature but you can also just use the adventure to sacrifice one of your creatures, maybe kill something of the opponent's, and then play out Callus Cell Sword. So you've managed to destroy something of the opponent's, and this comes in at least as a 3-3. Three, three. Um, then we've got Edge Wall Pack, a 4-mana 3-3 three, three menace dog creature. When it enters, you create another 1-1 one, one rat, which is pretty simple. And we have Red Cap Gutter Dweller, a 4-mana 3-3 three, three menace goblin creature. Um, when it enters, you create two black rats, 
And in the beginning of your upkeep, you can sacrifice another creature, which is probably going to be a rat. And if you do, you put a plus one counter on the gutter dweller, and you can exile the top card of your library and play that card this turn. So a nice bit of virtual card advantage. And if you have um, Lord Skitter, uh, which is the rare, and you have Red Cap Gutter Dweller, which is also a rare, um, then Lord Skitter can make those rats and the Gutter Dweller can eat them every turn. Unfortunately, being the um, jump in pack, it's that you're only going to get one of these because it's one or the other in the actual jump in event. But if you have them both in your collection, you might be able to make a decent Rakdos rat deck that happens to use those two and works really well together. Because you've got loads of creatures what you probably need, because a lot of these things are quite cheap, is some way of having card advantage. So being able to draw or exile an extra card every turn is going to be really useful. So that's the other really um, well-supported creature type in the uh, Wilds of Eldraine. The ninth deck we have is the Monsters deck. So this is the red and green deck. Uh, that works on getting out some big creatures potentially, um, especially when we have Ruby, the Daring Tracker, a two mana, one, two creature with haste. Um, you can tap it for extra red or green. And when it attacks, if you control a creature with power four or greater, it gets plus two, plus two till end of turn. So we want to make sure we have something else with power four or greater to be able to enable this to live up to its potential. Uh, we've also got some combat tricks, so like Monstrous Rage is a really good one. You give something plus two plus O till end of turn and cre and create a monster roll token and add that onto it, which is an extra plus one, plus one and trample. So this is giving something plus three, plus one and trample, where it keeps the plus one, plus one and trample ongoing. And it's only one mana instant, so it's a really good card. I really like that one. Uh, we've got Boundary Lands Ranger, two mana, two, two at the beginning of combat on your turn. If you control a creature with power four or greater, you may discard a card if you do draw a card, which is going to help you filter through things as well. So we really want to find some creatures with power four or greater. Uh, which is marked as a two mana sorcery. You can discard a card and draw two cards. Um, so it's equal on in terms of number of cards used. Um, and you can create a wicked roll token attached to one of your creatures, which is the plus one, plus one. And um, lose the opponent loses one life when that goes into the graveyard. We've got the Territorial Witch Stalker, a 2-mana 3-2 defender. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if you control a creature with power 4 or greater, it gets plus 1, plus 0, and it can attack as though it didn't have defender. So we need to get these big creatures with 4 power. And here's the first one, Minecart Daredevil, a 3-mana 4-2 creature, a dwarf that also has an instant adventure to give another creature plus 2, plus 1 till end of turn. So if you need to... Um, normally you'd use an instant like that as a combat trick when the opponent's already declared blockers, but you might want to use it before combat to maybe um, enable Territorial Witch Stalker to have two power, or maybe something else like the Boundary Lands Ranger will have um, four power, I mean two additional, so like four power. Um, yeah, so you can enable some things to have four power for the beginning of combat when it triggers other things. We've got Curse of the Werefox, which is the monster roll token and fighting, um, which is obviously good removal, but also boosting your creature long term. Uh, Ferocious Werefox is a four mana, four three with trample. So that's going to enable the other four power synergies. And you have um, another instant to create a monster roll token attached to one of your creatures. Um, obviously not as good as the Monstrous Rage because that's one mana gives the monster roll token and plus two, and this is two mana and only gives the monster roll token, but because it's on an adventure, it's virtual card advantage as well, because you're not having to draw an extra card to be able to cast the Werefox later on. Then we've got Beanstalk Worm, a five mana, five, four creature with reach. It can also help you ramp with the sorcery adventure to play an additional card this turn, a land card this turn. Um, and then we've got Realm Scorcher Hellkite, a 4-6 creature for 6 mana. Um, it has flying, it has haste. And when it enters the battlefield, you can bargain and you can add 4 mana in any combination of colours. So that really does help ramp and do some extra damage. Um, but it also enables its own ability, which is paying 2 mana to deal 1 damage to any target. So you can start picking some things off. And if you have lots of mana... Um, like obviously it gives you four potentially when you cast it but on your next turn when you untap 
if you had six at least to cast this and you cast it normally, then you can probably do one damage at least three times over to any target, which is good just for finishing off an opponent or picking off their creatures that are maybe a bit more of a pain, those little creatures. And we also have Storm Keld Vanguard, a six mana, six, seven giant warrior, and it can't be blocked by creatures with power two or less. So potentially a little bit of evasion to get through um, some kind of token decks or small creature decks. And it also has the sorcery adventure two mana to destroy an artifact or enchantment. Um, there's lots of enchantments in the deck with um, the roll tokens. There are lots of artifacts in the deck with food tokens. There's a few sagas. There are obviously enchantments as well, which might be good to destroy. Um, there's not so many like artifact or enchantment creatures. I think there's a couple of enchantment creatures. I'm not entirely sure. I'll have to look that up. But I don't think there's many artifact creatures apart from maybe like the tough cookie. So I don't know how useful destroying artifacts or enchantments is in this um, in this set. Like I said, there are some sagas and some things, and you'll find some roll tokens. So maybe it does help with those. Shame it's not instant speed, but still um, not a bad card to get a 6-7 with some evasion for 6 mana. And obviously enables all the other synergies of having power 4 or higher. So that's going to help finish things off. And obviously it's a really good target to give a monster roll token to, to give it trample. Um, the same with the Realm Scorcher if the opponent has any flying blockers as well. Okay, so in the alternative cards for this one, we've got Picnic Ruiner, which is a 2 mana 2-2, two, two, which also benefits when you have a creature with power 4 or greater. It gains double strike till end of turn, which is really useful, especially with um, roll tokens, because double strike with a plus 1 plus 1 or with Monstrous Rage is going to do a lot of extra damage. And then we've got a 4 mana Sorcery Adventure, where you can distribute 3 plus 1 counters among any number of creatures you control, which could help enable the power 4 or greater, because you could put it on some other creature that has um, lower power, and now you do have a creature with power 4 or greater. Uh, which is also what you can do with Bestial Bloodline. A 2 mana aura that enchants a creature, gives it plus 2, plus 2. Um, so basically you can turn anything else into a 4 power creature, which is going to really help enable all those other things as well. And if it happens to go to the graveyard, it's a bit slow paying 5 mana to put it back into your hand and then to recast it for another 2. But you can, if uh, you get to that point, or if you have lots of land out and you have nothing else to use it on. We've got the Huntsman's Redemption, a 3 mana sorcery where you can create a 3-3 three, three green beast. Then you can sacrifice a creature, and if you do, you can search your library for another creature and put it into your hand, which in this case, you might have maybe the Territorial Witch Stalker isn't doing much for you. It's a shame there's not many like um, small creature tokens. If this happens to be paired up with another jumping pack that has lots of tokens, then that sacrifice a creature gets even better. But you can go and look for a creature that's either going to pay off the uh, four power or higher, or maybe you find something else that has four power that you want to put out instead. And you can also give on the third chapter up to two creatures, plus two, plus two, and trample till end of turn. Plus two can help enable those synergies. Obviously the trample on the big creatures might help you finish off the game. And then we've got Verdant Outrider, a three mana, four, two creature. So it has that four power and you can pay two mana so it can't be blocked by creatures with power two or less this turn. So depending on what your opponent has, that might help you get through and do a good amount of damage, uh, maybe early on when they don't have such bigger creatures out. But yeah, it enables all the four power synergies as well. So if you pair this with another jump impact that has some other big creatures or helps you ramp, um, so basically like the other green pack, the uh, hungry pack, which helps you ramp and put out big creatures. And if it has the elvish um, archivist in there as well, then you have other ways of making enchantments with the um, roll tokens in this um, pack. So it's going to help that draw extra cards as well. So they work really well together. So if you get hungry monsters, uh, that's a pretty good combination. And then the last pack we have is the dress up pack. So this is another um, enchantment or roll token synergy deck. Works really well with the white um, jump in pack, the charmed one that creates lots of um, roll tokens as well. Um, so yeah, going through the cards in here, we've got Royal Treatment, 
give something hexproof and create a royal roll token, which is a plus one, plus one, and ward. We've got Toadstool Admirer, a one mana, one, one with ward two, which can grow over time by paying four mana to put a plus one counter onto it. We've got Armory Mice, which seems kind of funny because it's a celebration card, so it works better with the red and white, uh, with the red deck with celebration. Um, and yeah, it's a 3-1 creature, which is pretty strong for a mouse, but it also gets plus 0, plus 2, as long as two or more non-land permanents enter the battlefield under your control this turn. And the roll tokens do help with this because they are additional non-land permanents entering. So you can trigger this at instant speed with something like royal treatment. So depending on how your opponent blocks, you might be able to get them uh, using that as a de decent combat trick. Uh, we've got Cooped Up, which is the two-mana aura, which can... Um, pacify something and can exile it later on if you need to. We have Unassuming Sage, a 2 mana 2-2. Two, two. When it enters you can pay an additional 2 and if you do you create another Sorcerer roll token which is plus 1 plus 1 and scry when it attacks. We've got Graceful Takedown, it needs to have some removal. Uh, we have a 2 mana Sorcery, any number of target enchanted creatures you control and up to one other target creature you control, each deal damage equal to their power. To target creature you don't control. So if you have lots of roll tokens on things, so if you're getting that from the uh, white pack, if you're, if you're doing that one with this green and white one, then you're going to have lots of things with um, rolls on, so you can do lots of damage with this. Obviously if you don't have many creatures it's not particularly useful, but at least we do have other removal or type of removal that doesn't rely on your creatures. Uh, we've got Woodland Acolyte, which is another adventure. There's a 3 mana 2-2 two, two. when it enters the battlefield you draw a card, which is nice, but you can also use the instant first. You put a target permanent card from your graveyard on top of your library. So effectively we've got here 4 mana to take anything from the graveyard and end up putting it into your hand because you also get the 2-2 two, two that draws a card. So that's not too bad. Um, okay, we've got Red Tooth Genealogist which is a 3-mana, 2-3 creature. When it enters the battlefield, you create another Royal Roll token attached to another creature, so it can't be this one. But maybe uh, putting that onto a Toadstool Admirer would be a good thing, because it's already got Ward 2. If you put a Royal Roll token onto this, it now has Ward 3, so it becomes um, a much more powerful threat later on, because it keeps adding plus 1 counters, so the opponent probably wants to get rid of it as soon as possible. We've got Besotted Knight, which can create another Royal Roll token uh, with the Sorcery Adventure, or it's a 3-3 creature after that for 4 mana, which isn't great, but I guess if you at least have a way of getting another roll onto this, it becomes a 4-4 with some added ability. It's not a particularly good creature, um, especially when you compare it to things like Yenna, Red Tooth Regent, a 4 mana 4-4, four, four, where you can pay two to tap it and choose an enchantment you control that doesn't have the same name as another permanent you control. So it has to be an enchantment you only have one copy of, and you create a token that's a copy of that. And if it's an aura, you get to untap and then scry two. So you might have a royal roll token on something and maybe a sorcerer roll token on something else. You can tap it, you can make an extra one, um, you can, they're untaps and you get to do it again, you get to scry, there's lots of value you get from Yenna. And then we've got Sir Armand the Redeemer, 5 mana 4-4, four, four. when it enters, create a monster roll token, so a different type of roll, which is plus 1, plus 1 and trample, and then all other enchanted creatures you control get plus 1, plus 1, which includes uh, Sir Armand if he happens to be, or she happens to be, um, yeah. <laughs> enchanted. So some really good synergies with auras, which is why it works really well with the right, the white pack as well. But there's a couple of other things that work well with these cards. We've got Troublemaker Oof, is that how you're meant to pronounce it? A 2 mana 2-2 two, two that can bargain, and you have lots of roll tokens, you can bargain them. Uh, when it enters, if it was bargained, you can exile an artifact or enchantment and opponent controls. So depending on what they have going on on their side, um, can be a good way to remove something. We've got Tangle Span Lookout, a 3 mana 2 3 creature. When an aura enters a battlefield under your control, you draw a card. Now, this one is going to give you lots of value ongoing, especially if you can create lots of roll tokens because they're auras and you're going to draw loads of extra cards from those. So, this is definitely a good one to get in the pack. 
We've got Archon of the Wild Rose, a 4 mana 4-4 four, four flyer, where other creatures you control that have auras now have base power toughness 4-4 four, four, and have flying. So if you get some auras on the smaller creatures and then get this out, you're going to have some really big flying creatures that are going to be able to trample or have ward or they can scry. So this is a really good finisher to have in the deck. And then we've got Two Unveiled Guide, a 4 mana 2-3 flyer with Celebration. So Celebration works well with roll tokens. Um, it can get plus 1, plus 0 and lifelink um, if Celebration is activated, which is nice. It's not amazing, but I mean, it's a flyer. You can give it a roll token. It can get bigger. So it works pretty well. So those are all of the 10 jump in packs for the Wilds of Eldraine. It takes a while to go through all of those. So I've tried to do it as quickly as possible, but let me know what you think in the comments, which is your favorite one, which ones do you think work really well together? Okay, well, thanks for watching this video to the end. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you don't want to miss out on any future videos. I'll see you in the next one.